Hey there, I'm Sean Lavery representing Dog Robotics, FRC and VRC Team 1712. I'm here to talk to you about optimizing motor and ratio selections. This is a presentation I've been giving in person at various presentations like the Comcast Boot Camp and Storm Robotics' um, Compass Alliance or Compass event um, for several years. This is the updated for December 2019 version. So historically, if you're watching this in the future from when I'm giving it, um, this is after the Falcon 500 has been announced, but before any teams really got a chance to play with it. So that's kind of where we're at in terms of motor selections I'm going to talk about. So who am I? Um, I work for NAVC Philadelphia down in South Philadelphia. It's effectively a branch of the Navy um, as a fuel control specialist and tank level indicator system specialist um, and service engineering agent. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Drexel University. I'm an alumni of Drexel as well as Herndon High School where I was a participant on FRC Team 116 during my high school years. And ever since I graduated, I've been a mentor here with Dogma 1712. I've been now in my second year as lead mentor. And personally, my favorite part of FRC is drivetrains. That's always been my passion. I love mechanism design. I love outreach. I love the business aspects. I've done all the different parts of a team. But the part I love spending my most thoughts on is the drivetrain. And that's what I feel I design better than anything else I design on a robot. Um, and I work now to try to pass this information along to my students and hopefully to anyone else watching this. Some of the goals for what I'm looking to do today. Um, what I'm not looking to do is give you a basic understanding of FRC drivetrains. There's already a bunch of great resources that talk about how DC direct current motors work, um, what mechanical advantage is, how you trade torque for speed within the set amount of power you have. Um, there isn't a lot of basic math in here. There's a couple times where I'm gonna throw up an equation on the screen, um, but there are other resources that talk about a lot of the math that drives this. Um, I don't explicitly discuss omnidirectional drivetrains, but although most of these lessons can still be applied. I mean, you can, you can apply this to a swerve drive or mechanum or whatever, even though I've ostensibly geared this mostly towards tank drives. Um, but what hopefully, given what I'm not doing, what I am trying to do is give you a better understanding of broad concepts um, and then narrowing it down to the point where you can actually apply them effectively um, to improve your understanding of FRC drivetrain design. Um, I'm not going to go step by step, but I am going to share you a lot of resources and calculators you can use, um, as well as I'm going to break some of the poor metrics you may have been designing for before um, and tell you a better way to design for something else, um, so rather than just op rather than just throwing as many watts and as many motors as possible or throwing for as fast as many feet per second as possible. I'm going to talk about better ways to analyze your power you have available and how fast you get from point A to point B. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to talk about motor selection. I'm going to talk about sprint distances. Talk about traction limiting. We're gonna have a brief discussion of two speed drivetrains, one versus two speed. Then I'll throw out some general tips and resources. Um, and if I was doing this a live session, we'd have some questions and discussions at the end. Um, but since we're on the power of the internet, feel free to post your questions in the comments below or find us on other social media. We're basically at Dogma1712 on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, YouTube, Snapchat, what have you. Um, so if you have further questions, reach out to us and we'll try to answer them. Um, so talking first as we get into the actual content here, what are the viable brushed motors options? I know you all you want to hear about brushless, it's coming, don't worry. Um, and basically for the past several years there's been three, um, and now really it's kind of back down to two because in the brushless age not many teams are be using 775 Pros or Animark Red Lines in their drives anymore. Um, to give you a little historical context of where the sim motor comes from, that's the motor up here on the top. Um, let me go to the laser pointer mode just to make this a little extra effective. Um, the sim motor is an industry motor. It's the Chihuahua Industries motor, CCL Industries motor. It's a motor that was out in the world as a trailer jack motor that's been adopted for FRC design. Um, it was a game-changing moment when it was first in introduced in, I think, 2003 or four is the first season we had it. Um, in 2005 is the first season we were able to use up to four of them. Um, as opposed to a lot of the previous drill motors and whatnot, it doesn't have a whole lot of forward back biasing in it. Um, it's wound to go both speeds in both directions. Um, it's a sealed motor, it's about 337 watts, which is great. Um, and it's decently bulky, three and a half inches long, something like that. Um, but it's been kind of the FRC standard. Um, it would, first now owns the design for it. Um, if you really want to get back in history, I um, mean, you talk reading old Chief Delphi or whatever, um, it used to be called the chip motor a lot because we didn't, the SIM, the CIM abbreviation didn't come into play until more recently. Um, so a lot of teams called it a chip. Uh, my team, because we couldn't say Chihuahua, called it the Chalupa motor. Um, so if you ever want to impress your friends or talk about history, there's a little bit of fun factoids for you. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, that was a motor that we took from industry, first bought the design, it's been distributed to first teams. 
Um, and now a whole bunch of first specific vendors make it, but it wasn't designed specifically for first robotics competition. The mini sim, on the other hand, was. Um, it was designed by Vax released several years ago now. Um, it's also a sealed motor. It's about equivalent to a two thirds of a sim in terms of rated peak power, um, as well as weight and length. Um, so it's a miniature sim, the mini sim. Um, it's designed as a drop-in replacement. The mounting holes and the output shaft are the same. The same with the boss around the output shaft. But what's different, as it was designed specifically for FRC, is instead of having bushings on the shaft, it has bearings. Um, I believe the coatings on the windings are also a little bit different. Um, what that does is with a bearing there, it's lower friction, which means less of your energy is converted to heat, which means there's less heat buildup. It's designed specifically for FRC type conditions, not a, I'm going to raise a trailer for 15, 30 seconds and then turn off for a month. Um, it's designed for, I'm going full speed, full reverse, blah, 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 running with these three minute chunks over and over again. Um, it's designed specifically for first conditions. So that's some of the reasons teams you might see start using mini sims in the drivetrain um, is they build up less heat and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and how that may impact your motor performance in a couple slides. Um, on the bottom of the screen we have, as opposed to the other two, which are sealed motors, you have a fan cooled motor. Um, the Vex Pro 775 Pro or the Animark Redline, they're the same motor, just Redline's red. There's now a Redline A, which is supposed to be 10% more free speed at the same current draw, so 10% more power. Um, but functionally they're pretty much the same. They're a lot smaller, a lot lighter than the Sims and the Mini Sims but they are fan cooled. Um, so what that means is you see these vents up here on the front and these vents on the back. They're designed to pull air in the front and expel it out the back. There's actually on the rotor of the motor inside this casing right about here, there's a fan that pulls that air. So not only does as this motor spin fat, so all motors when they spin faster, they're gonna be happier. They're at their free speed. They're not loaded as much. They're generating, they're operating more efficiently at peak efficiency, which means they generate less heat per input power. Um, but with a fan cooled motor that it doubled down on that when it's spinning fast not only is it generating less heat it's expelling more heat as the fan turns faster which means on the other end of the spectrum when it turns slower you're generating more heat you're closer to stall and you're expelling less heat because you're turning slower um, so it can be a double-edged sword so fan cooled motors are awesome for high speed low load applications um, using them in a drivetrain where you may be getting into the closer to the stall on the spectrum you have to be very mindful of how you load them so you don't get into situations where you're you're cooking the motor and causing irreversible failures inside. Um, like I said, these used to be pretty common for a couple of years um, amongst some bleeding edge teams who are trying to save a couple pounds of drivetrain weight. Uh, but now within the age of brushless motors, you're gonna see less and less and less of them. So one of the first resources I wanna share with you is motors.vex.com. That's where you can find a lot of this data that I'm gonna reference about these motors and it's where I'm pulling it from. It's a website I kind of live and breathe for the first couple weeks of the build season. Slightly outdated screenshot here, um, but if you were to click, it shows you basic high level motor data, your free speed, free current, max power, stall torque, and stall current for all the different motor options or almost all the different motor options. If you were to click on any of them, you get a screen kind of like this, um, where you can go and you pull up all the data about any specific motor you have. Motor curve, there are a lot of great videos about how to read these, so I won't go into too much detail here, um, but it, basically you just need to read the axes and read your labels and you can plot this out to see your speed versus your current and your torque or whatever output line you're reading. Um, so at this peak power point here, if you were to load the motor at peak power, which is 50% of its free speed, so it's 50% of the length of here, uh, if you were to load it at 50% speed, you'd do what they're calling the peak power test right beneath there. That's showing over time how that peak power will decay when at held when the motor is loaded to 50% speed and at max voltage. Um, they also do a locked rotor test where they're physically causing the motor to be at stall and they run it at a whole bunch of different input voltages, see how long it takes to fail and how much output torque it's giving along that length of time. Um, so this is great data, not just for drivetrain design, but for any um, mechanism or robot design you're doing over the course of the first season. Uh, I'm gonna break my script here a little bit and actually just take you to the website to show you what it looks like now. Um, so it's been updated to have the Neo and the Falcon tests. Um, we'll talk more about the brushless and you can kind of go around and click on all of them. Um, and as I'll mention here in a second, the Neo and the Falcon don't have the locked rotor or the stall tests um, or the peak power tests, just because the way their test methodology is a little bit different. Um, for some reason, Neo is not loading, there we go. Um, so this is what it looks like now. If I were to click on, say the bag motor, not a drivetrain motor, but it does have all these different tests you'd be interested in performing. Hop back into my presentation. 
Um, so using some of this peak power data, that peak power test I spent a lot of time explaining, um, here's how a sim compares to a mini sim and why you might want to start considering mini sims over sims in your drivetrain, especially if you're willing to use six motors as opposed to four total in your drivetrain, so three per side or versus two per side. Um, over the first 30 seconds of the peak power test, you see a pretty rapid decay in the sim line, this maroon line here. Um, it's got its 337 rated start, um, but about 30 seconds in, it's already down to 250. Um, granted, these are peak power tests. It's not as bad as a real match will not be as bad as this. You're not peak power 100% of the time in the real match, but you are throwing a lot of power and a lot of energy at these, so it's you, you are going to see something like this. Um, so already within 30 seconds, you've seen these motors narrow their gap pretty substantially from this base. It starts like more than 100 watt difference, and now we're down to within 50 watts of each other. Um, by the end of this three minute long test, which is slightly longer than a match, they're practically overlapping. Um, so you can see that the heat buildup in the sim affects its performance a lot more than the lesser heat buildup in the mini sim affects it. Um, so while generally teams, if they're swapping a mini sim, will apply three per side or six total as opposed to two per side and four total for the sims, um, you can see the performance even on a one-to-one -one basis narrows substantially over the course of matches. In addition, um, this is the rated start power. Um, if you've done some damage to the motor just over time with loading, it may not start all the way up here, as well as if it's still hot from its prior match, like in these fast turnarounds during the, the semifinals and the finals and the playoffs, you may still have some residual heat. You're not going to cool down. You may be starting to operate your match somewhere in this range. Who knows? Um, so that's part of the reason that my team in particular and a lot of other teams have switched to using these six total mini sim drive trains if they're still using brush motors. Um, we've had great performance with them the last few years. I would say if it weren't for some of these brush, brushless motors I'm talking about, I'd say we'd be content running these for basically forever. Um, but it's, it's a great option to help get better performance out of a similar package. Um, 775 Pro peak power test. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because most teams aren't really looking at them anymore for drivetrains. Um, you do see a real steep initial drop down from its rated wattage to 200 watts within the first 10 seconds of peak power. Um, and it, in this test performed at 12 volts, it does fail in less than the length of one match. Um, so limiting your voltage or spreading your motor load across a whole bunch of motors or other methods to reduce the amount of uh, load applied to these motors is essential if you want to use a 775 Pro in your drivetrain. Um, so let's get into the brushless revolution. I know that's a lot of what you guys want to talk about. It's here. Um, I got this nice little GIF in the corner kind of showing how they work, uh, how an Outrunner style motor works, which is our motors. I'm not sure about the Falcon 500, but I know the Neo is an Outrunner. It just has a case around it. Um, basically, they work kind of like a three-phase AC motor. Um, even though they have a direct current input, um, we just shuffle it around. So as the rotor turns around the stators, we change which ones are energized. Um, they provide a lot superior power density and they have fewer mechanically touching parts. So hypothetically, they have less wear. Um, they become the kind of the standard, especially in hobbies that have like high speed, lower load applications. Um, things like RC airplanes, RC boats use almost brushless motors exclusively at this point. Um, a lot of combat robots are switching there, but there are some teething concerns um, with qualities of speed controllers and whatnot. But as you can kind of see in that GIF, the way that these work, um, as the rotor turns, you want to make sure that the proper coils are engaged. Um, in order to achieve that, you need to have a sensor somewhere in your motor. Um, they, there are sensorless options, but you give up a lot of the advantages that you want if you go with the centralist option, they're gonna, really, they're gonna have a lot worse startup torque as they start getting spinning. Um, both the Neo and the Falcon and the older NEDEC motors, which aren't really a drivetrain motor in the Falcon, or the Neo 550, which isn't really a drivetrain motor, or maybe it is, who knows, um, have integrated Hall Effect sensors or some kind of integrated encoder that'll help achieve this. We don't have to worry about this as the end user because all of the options that we have for FRC are censored brushless motors. But what it does mean is that Currently at the point, they're kind of all partnered to their available speed controller. The Falcon 500 has its built in. Um, Spark Max is used with the Neo. Um, you can't really mix and match there. And you have to have these integrated encoders plugged into those speed controllers. Um, and then you can kind of see an example of the power density here. The Falcon 500 is functionally basically the same size as a mini sim, despite putting out a whole lot more power than even the sim. 
So let's get into some of the data. Um, I have the Falcon 500 motor curve there, and if you were just looking at that motor curve alone, you'd be blown away by what it theoretically can do. The peak power is 783 watts. Um, if you translate that to units that we typically don't see a whole lot of mentioned in FRC, that's a one horsepower motor. But the reality is, if you also look a little bit deeper, dig deeper uh, into the data, you see that stall current is 257 amps. Um, and then if I were to pull down from my peak power, down to my current line here, go over to the current rating over here, you see I'm still pulling over 100 amps at peak power. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about current draw power budgeting and breakers in a minute. But suffice to say at the moment, there is no individual breaker for a motor that rate up to 100 amps. Our total <laughs> our total robot breaker is only 120 amps. Um, so there's nothing in FRC that's going to allow this to pull peak power for any substantial amount of time. So that's part of the reason VEX has also provided this at 40 amp chart and then at 30, at 20, at 10. But at 40 is kind of the one we're going to focus at for the drivetrain discussion. You can see there it's still a 400 watt motor, but that's half of what you'd seen above. Um, and the difference between that and the Neo is much, much smaller, as well as the same of the Mini Sim. Um, as well as I mentioned a little bit ago on the motors.vex.com site, they don't have locked rotor or max power tests. Um, that's the result of how the functional tests are performed. With the DC brushed motors, you can just hook up a DC power supply and put that much voltage into the motor, and then you can load it at how you need and see what it does. There's no motor controller involved. With the brushless, because you need to the way they work, as I showed in the last slide, you need that motor controller involved, and we have these paired motor controllers. A lot of these motor controllers have things like current limits or temperature limits that will not built into them that will impact how these other tests would run. Um, so they don't have as much data there. Um, Rev does have some data for their, their motor, but not for the Falcon. Um, but even Rev's data, you have to think about how that test is performed, which I'm gonna talk about here, um, as well as comparing different sources together. So this is talking about the SIM and the NEO, looking at their locked rotor tests. Uh, if you just were to look at these graphs, you'd see the green, the 12 volt line for both. It's like, oh, they failed. The red one looks like it's failing even further. But once, it's had, once again, these are different data sources. You want to look at the time down here. This, this one's maxing out at 150 seconds here. If you were to go straight up, you're at the 300 second mark here. Um, so the 150 second here translates to here. Um, so if you're looking at actually when these fail, um, you're, you're starting to see them go downhill somewhere right around the 50 second mark. Um, so it's pretty similar at full unrated voltage. Uh, but also keep in mind that during the NEO test, they're being run through a controller rather than just the DC power supply. They have a 40 amp breaker, um, stuff like that. But even that, even the 40 amp breaker alone, you're still seeing a failure. So it's not sufficient on its own to protect it under full load. Um, but ultimately, if you look at these, you see pretty similar failure behaviors between the SIM and the NEO. Um, and plus we have a whole full season worth of NEO testing now. Um, there have, some teams have reported failures and whatnot, but generally pretty positive. Um, but just remember to consider your sources, consider the difference in testing methodology when you're comparing anything between the SIM, the NEO, and the new Falcon 500. Um, I will say that at this point in time, um, we have more published data on the Falcon 500 than we had at this point in time last year with the NEO. But conversely, teams have a lot more on hand data with the NEO last year than we have this year. Um, they'd already been delivered to customers at this point in late December. Um, beta teams had been running them during off-season events and whatnot, um, as opposed to the Falcon 500. Beta team just got them not too long ago. They found some problems, it's delayed the shipping. Um, and as far as I can tell, no consumer teams have received their Falcon 500s as consumers yet. Um, so while there's a lot more published data than we had at this point in time with the NEO last year, we don't necessarily have all the, the empirical data we'd want with the Falcon 500. So it's up to your team to decide how much risk you want to be with it being an early adopter um, that, that's up to you um, so decide that for your team but as well um, also remember there's some teething concerns with any new motor but there's a lot of firmware updates with the the neo um, falcon 500 is part of the ctre the crossroad electronics ecosystem so if you have a trust for that brand um, you may want to you may want to factor that into your decision if you feel that they won't have the same kind of firmware update teething concerns or not but we'll see um, so now we're going to start talking about power budgeting. Um, you have a total power distribution panel of slots of 16, 8 with a 40 amp. I don't know of any team who's running 20 or 30 amp breakers on their drivetrain. Um, so generally you're looking at the 8 40 amp slots and deciding how many motors you can allocate for your drivetrain. Then you want to consider your power budgeting both on a per motor basis and a total power consumption basis. So per motor we're talking about how much beyond or up to that 40 amp breaker you can pull on each individual motor. Um, fortunately, breakers don't trip. A 40 amp breaker doesn't trip at 41 amps. 
can run almost indefinitely at 135%, uh, which is about 50 amps. Granted, there's going to be some individual variation on breaker to breaker, so you probably don't want to design all the way up to that edge. Give yourself some margin error. Probably design still around 40 amps. Um, but you can pull substantially more than that for very short periods of time. That's what this chart over on the side is showing, the time versus current. It shows trip time in seconds versus percent of your rated current. Um, so over here at 200%, which would be 80 amps on a 40 amp breaker, you see this red line's crossing right around the one second mark. You can pull 80 amps for a second-ish. Um, so you can you can have these spikes and it may not cripple your drive, um, but just be aware of it. The resettable breakers do reset. What doesn't reset is your main breaker, your total power draw, the 120 amp breaker on your robot, the thing with the red button and the switch you close. Um, if that trips, you're out of power for the rest of the match. So you don't want to pull too much total current. Um, this used to be a problem back in the C-Rio days, but now we have the Robo-Rio. Um, and the Robo-Rio has a three-stage voltage brownout that'll hit hopefully before that main breaker trips. Uh, I haven't heard of many main breaker trips issues um, in modern FRC that weren't because of something physically hitting the breaker. Um, so these brownouts for total voltage drop, um, the, the stage one happens at, I believe, 6.9 volts system voltage. Um, it'll start turning off your motors. Um, so it's not the end of the world, but you really want to avoid hitting it. It'll affect your performance. You'll start seeing, if you've see if you ever seen robots just kind of stutter around the field, it's probably browning out. Um, so you want to consider your total power drop across all your motors, drivetrain and mechanism and compressor and whatever else. Um, your total voltage drop to avoid brownouts, as well as when you're applying power to a lot of things, you're going to start seeing voltage sag. You're not going to see all the power you'd want from your motor or from your battery reaching the motors you want if you're powering too many things at once. So that's where you see some voltage sag. Um, there are a lot of scenarios where you can try to mitigate the worst cases um, by using stuff on the newer motor controllers like current limits or building like a voltage ramp into your software so that when you're accelerating from dead stop or accelerating from full forward to full reverse, you don't apply 100% of that voltage right away. You build it up over a couple milliseconds. It's a nice open loop way to do it. Um, you can also put current limits on the Talon SRX, Spark Neo, or Rev, Spark Max with the Neos. Um, there are current limits you can set um, for some of these higher current draw situations like turning in place with high traction wheels or in a stall condition like a pushing match or your autonomous is driving into a wall or something like that. Um, you can try to build around that with current limits. Um, now we're going to talk about motor quantities based off this power budgeting. How many motors can you budget for your drivetrain? Um, this slide was written with brushed motors in mind, but a lot of cases you can substitute Sim to mean Neo or Falcon um, just fine as a shorthand. Um, two Sims, two total motors in your drivetrain. This is total, not per side. This is total in your drivetrain. It's a bad idea. It's a rookie mistake that rookie teams or other teams will make once in their career and probably never do again. Um, you get into these really high current draw per motors where you're flirting with your breaker limits. As well, you just don't have much power to be translated into torque, to be translated into acceleration for your drivetrain. Teams will make that mistake once, they realize it, and they don't do it again. Um, the only exception might be something like Lunacy or maybe, maybe, maybe Re Recycle Rush, even though I wouldn't recommend it there, um, where the Lunacy get a real low friction floor, a lot of your power gets wasted anyway. Maybe you get away with a two-sim drive in that, but otherwise, don't really worry about it. Just stay away from it. Four sims has been the kitbot standard since 2005 or 2006. Um, it works. It'll get you around the field. You can be plenty competitive with a four-sim drivetrain. Um, six sims... It's the, I wouldn't do six sims for the sake of six sims. It's the risky air quote standard. Um, it basically, it provides more power, but you may need to make sure that you're actually doing something with that power um, because you can start getting into the brownout conditions I described above. Um, as well as there are a lot of things you can do to regulate and mitigate those high power draws, but those situations in which you're applying this current limit or you're applying this voltage ramp are the same situations in which the power is often most beneficial to you. Um, the most you, you, if you're working on accelerating quicker, you want more power to throw more torque to accelerate quicker. If you also throw a voltage ramp there, you're taking away some of that same advantage you just had. Granted, you can still get an advantage, like it doesn't take away the whole advantage. The voltage ramp is usually only a fraction of a second, um, but you just need to consider that. Um, six mini sims is functionally similar to four sims. I already talked about this. Uh, earlier, especially the fully rated, and it may actually be better once you derated them um, over the course of the match. But it, it also spreads the power draw and the heat across more motors, so you're less likely to trip the breaker, um, and your motors are in a 
you're spreading that heat across more of them um, so you're operating in a happier range on each of them but it does use more power distribution panel slots you're using six of them as opposed to four um, it is possible to mix sims and mini sims or falcons and neos and whatever else um, just be aware I, I probably if, if I were going brushless I'd probably stick with the brushless option I want I don't see there's not a whole lot of advantage to mixing a falcon with a neo or a falcon with a mini sim or something like that um, but there are there could be advantages to get to tune your motors exactly how you want it between mixing sims and mini sims together all of those motors have the same mounting face it makes it really easy to pop them into the same gearbox and then interchange between them so free speed um, think about the first thing a scout asks you about your drivetrain maybe one of the first couple questions they're gonna ask you how many wheels you got what motors you got what wheels you got and how fast is your robot and the answer they're typically looking for as they're coming around to talk to you in your pit is how many feet per second is my robot going um, it tells you the theoretical top speed but it doesn't actually tell you how fast anyone's getting anywhere it can be useful shorthand but it's not the most effective way to actually design your drivetrain um, so in order to calculate that in order to get that feet per second that velocity of your robot you take your rotational free speed of your motor, the diameter of your wheel, and multiply them together, and you divide that by your gear ratio effectively. It's how many times does your wheel turn per second. And it, we go one circumference, one rotation of the wheel in distance per rotation, basically. Um, but you can see there, there's no input for what motor you're actually using beyond its free speed. We don't ever factor in its power. We don't factor in its torque. We don't see how much acceleration. So theoretically, I could gear a window motor for the same free speed as my 6SIM drivetrain, but obviously the 6SIM is going to have more power and more acceleration. It's going to get up to speed and operate in a comfortable portion of its motor curve and not be stalled out the whole time like a window motor would be. So very obviously, this free speed doesn't actually tell me how long it takes to get from point A to point B. Think of it like a car. Um, sure, cars have top speeds that are sometimes advertised, but none of us are ever going to drive that top speed. What we care about is the 0 to 60 miles per hour analogy. Um, how long does it take to get from 0 to 60? And that's what we got to kind of think about and design for our drivetrains is how long does it actually take us to get from point A to point B, not our theoretical top speed. What good is having this really 35 feet per second top speed if that's too high on the motor curve to actually use or if we don't have enough runway on the field to get up to that top speed. If it takes us 300 feet of driving to get up to 35 feet per second, we're never going to get that on a 57 or 54 foot long field. Um, so how do, we, how do we actually design our drivetrains to get between things quickly? You look at sprint distances. Um, this is a great activity, even if you're not designing a drivetrain, this is a great activity to take your team through um, when you're doing strategic analysis of the game. Um, it's what are the points I'm going to be going full speed? What are my cycles, so to speak, if it's a cycle type game? Um, where do I load my game pieces? Where do I score them? What do I have to drive through, under, or around to get there? What are these longest distances which I'm going to be driving straight? Those are my sprints. Um, and when we're actually applying this to your drivetrain design, don't forget that your robot occupies space and you do accelerate and decelerate. Um, and don't forget about the autonomous mode. It's the most time sensitive portion of the match the autonomous, the hybrid, the sandstorm, whatever it's called this year. Um, it's usually 10, 15, 20 seconds long as opposed to the rest of the match is two minutes, give or take two and two and a half minutes. Um, so in certain games, you want to. You may want to prioritize your autonomous mode as what you're optimizing your sprints for. And you certainly want to consider them when you're doing your strategic analysis of the game. I have some examples down there. Um, the one that really, really comes into play is 2018, the scale races. Because the way 2018 was scored is um, you've got points for owning the scale per second. So getting there first obviously means you had more seconds of scoring, as well as it changed the physical state of the scale. Um, so you may actually screw up other teams from scoring in that period of time. Um, also gave you more time to score multi cubes so even in like 2019 getting your first object up there for your first hatch say onto the panel onto the rock of the cargo ship first give you more time to score your second um, or another game like 2012 like where there was balls on the center bridge 341 was really really good at getting those balls first um, and gave them more game pieces to score 2017 getting to the disc of the middle of the field first um, so stuff like that can matter um, so don't forget about autonomous um, so I'm going to go through some examples of previous games. When I wrote this presentation, this was a really, really relevant and recent example, and everyone knew what I'm talking about. Now only seniors on the team will have experience with this, and then even then it's only during the fall off-season competitions. Um, 2016 Stronghold, basically these things labeled outer workses were obstacles teams had to drive under, through, around, or had to manipulate something to get across. 
Um, with the exception of the low bar of your short bot, um, and even then, you really couldn't sprint across these. Um, you had to have some speed to get across some of them, but you were kind of stopping, not necessarily fully stopping, but it were, there was an action involved somewhere in there, whether it be driving over a large bump or raising something up, opening the gate, etc. Um, lowering a lever on the Cheval de Free that would slow you down. So your sprints were kind of divided on either side of them. Um, and if you're shooting from the outer works, if you're shooting from this position, your sprint is really short. It's really go to midfield, grab a ball, get to my thing, cross it, line up and shoot. Uh, if you're a low goal team or a batter shooter, you might have a little bit further to drive, um, especially if you're loading balls back here from where your human player rolled them out. Maybe you can get a little bit longer sprints back and forth, but generally these are shorter sprints. So even a lot of the best teams didn't have a super fast or super high top speed, like a team like 118, the Robonauts had a one speed drive train at about 10 and a half feet per second, I believe. Um, it doesn't sound super impressive, especially in the age where a lot of teams are talking about 16, 17, 18 foot per second drive trains. 118 realized they don't have to go that far. They'd rather optimize more to lower the current draw and build more towards the acceleration portion of their driving than the top speed portion because they don't have to drive that far. Very similar game like 2010 Breakaway. Um, you had these big bumps every one third of the field. Um, you couldn't sprint across them. You can try to do because it hazard it, uh, but good luck with that. <laughs> The, there was a uh, one team that had a weeble wobble bot, so to speak, where they would tumble across these, these bumps. It was actually really fun to watch. Um, but more of the story here is it's another thing where the, the field's getting broken into thirds. Your sprints aren't that long unless you start considering a corner-to-corner -corner sprint like this maroon line down here. Um, I'm speaking this one out of experience where we had a match where we were trying to score in these goals in the corners here and here. We had our balls, but there was a defender who'd keep getting in our way, and we couldn't get from one side to the other faster than the defender could. Um, so that may be a scenario where you look at it and say, hey, maybe that's the sprint we need. I'm not saying that was the right sprint to decide for that game, but it's something you might want to factor in. Um, 2015 Recycle Rush, Chief Delphi's least favorite game. Um, it's, but it serves as an example for where sprints really are really, really short. Um, the most common cycles were loading from here and scoring onto these platforms or loading from the landfill and scoring onto these platforms. These are basically turning your robot around and driving like two feet. You don't need to move super fast to do these, especially when you're holding five totes in a recycling bin or six totes in a recycling bin and you don't want to knock it over. This is a little bit longer, but it's still not something where you need to have a 20 feet per second drive train to do. Um, and autonomous, there was the potential for a three tote autonomous um, if you're doing this or a three bin autonomous. Uh, but even still, there's other robots, there's bins in your way that may interfere with that. Um, and even if you're interacting, you're probably slowing down as you get past each one. Uh, but it is worth at least thinking about because doing all that in 15 seconds did take up most of your 15 seconds. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, you have games like Steamworks and Ultimate Ascent, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, Ultimate Ascent. Steamworks, where you are going two-thirds of the field or longer repeatedly. You're loading from here. You're coming all the way around the field. You're scoring here, 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 and you're doing this over and over and over and over again. Um, and that may be a scenario in which you do want a little bit higher top speed for your sprints. Your sprints are longer. You have more time to get up to acceleration. Um, so it may be worth um, considering a little bit faster free speed for these games. Alternatively, there is also the autonomous sprint for Steamworks in which you want to maximize the amount of time you have to shoot from this hopper into this goal. Um, not a huge consideration unless you're very, very optimized for that strategy and completely giving up gears. 2013 Ultimate Ascent, same idea. You're loading from your loading corner, you're driving to the pyramid over and over and over again. There are some counterexamples to the whole concept of sprint distances, namely ro games that are very, very heavy on robot to robot interaction, more so than robots getting from point B or point A to point B over and over again. Um, Lunacy is the best example of this, where balls were scored in trailers that robots would tow behind them. Um, so we needed to outrun or outmaneuver other robots. Um, there's also a really low traction floor that caused slipping, so you, it really impacted your drivetrain design in that effect. Um, and sometimes even got as far as using propellers or fans to aid their acceleration. Um, the similar vein, 2014 Aerial Assist. Sure, there was a fixed location to score and a rough location where you could load from, although human players could throw you the ball. Um, most of this was focused on robot-to-robot -robot interaction. It was passing balls to teammates, avoiding defenders, getting past defenders where what you would need to optimize for is being better than an unknown team that you have never faced before, before your, your event, or you certainly haven't faced before you time you design your robot. Um, so you had to 
create this kind of dynamic, I need an edge in traction or acceleration or something, rather than I'm optimizing to go 12 feet over and over again. Um, so now more recent stuff. This is an actual picture taken from the Dogma Slack of January 7, 2019, right after kickoff, a couple days, um, of deep space. We looked at a whole bunch of different potential sprint distances you can pick to optimize between loading stations and scoring places. Um, and mapped out and estimated the distance between them. Um, there was a lot of options to choose from between autonomous or teleop and where we're loading, where we're scoring, so on and so forth. Um, and depending on what your strategy was, you might want to pick a different one of these. Um, we did find that a lot of these were within a few feet of each other, um, so there wasn't a whole lot of advantage. If we were, if we were optimizing for one, we are probably pretty close to optimize for the rest. Um, like the only exceptions being like if I wanted to load here and come all the way over to this rocket, this is substantially longer. Um, but that's probably not a strategy you want to make your plan A. It's probably not what you want to design your robot to do better than anyone else. Um, so ultimately, we ended up picking the 17 foot distance here, um, where we're from this loading station to scoring hatch panels on this rocket. Um, because we said we wanted to be a rocket bot, um, and it was close enough that that's what we picked. If your team had a different strategy, you might want to pick something different. Another recent example, 2018 Power Up. There are a lot of potential different ways to load objects, a lot of potential places different to score objects, whether it be the switch, the scale, or the exchange. Um, exchange bots had a really short run if you're loading from the pyramid and scoring the exchange. They had a really long run if you're trying to load from this loading panel and come all the way over to this exchange. No one would ever do that because that's a dumb strategy, but if you wanted to conceive a reason for a long sprint, that would be it. Um, I, would not opt I would not suggest picking that as your sprint for the year. Um, but most of the time, these were relatively short distances. If you're scoring in the switch here, you're just loading and scoring. If you're scoring the scale, you're turning around, driving a few feet, maybe driving 10, 15 feet this way. Um, they're relatively short. This is a decent sized sprint, but most teams, with the exception of teams that didn't have a ground loader, uh, so if you didn't have a ground loader, this would be the sprint you'd definitely pick. Um, but if you did, this is probably not the sprint you're picking because you're probably primarily focused on loading from the pyramid or loading from these on the ground here and moving them to the switch or the scale or wherever you're scoring. But are any of these the distance that for your team strategy you wanted to pick? For 17-12, we said no. These are all short, um, but there are time sensitive portions of this match that we wanted to build and optimize around. Um, but instead of doing it for teleop, we did it for autonomous. Um, so we, we said we wanted to be a scale bot. Before the season started, we, we determined we wanted to be an air quote high goal bot for that year. Um, so we, we looked at two different options. It's the crossover scale and the straightaway scale. Because um, with the randomized scale, you can never know which one is going to be on your side. Um, and ultimately, we picked this straight away. Um, ultimately, we'd also do a curved crossover. Um, but the mat, we weren't sure that was going to happen before the season started. Um, as well as these distances turned out to not be hugely different than this distance in terms of sprints. Um, so we optimized for that straightaway sprint distance. So what's the actual number we came up with? Um, well, at first you can look at them half length of the field, that's 27 feet long. But if I sprint for 27 feet, I'm going to go halfway into the scale. My robot, which occupies space, this is actually effectively a robot down here, um, would run into stuff. And I'm not going to have any way to decelerate. So what did we actually pick? We picked 18 feet. Um, there is a little bit of fudge factor. We subtracted the length of the scale here. It's not a fudge factor, but yeah, we subtracted half the length of the scale. We also subtracted the length of our robot. And then we fudge factored a little bit of room in to decelerate at the end. So that's what we ended up picking about 18 feet. Because um, we really wanted to get to the scale first. We wanted to establish ownership of the scale first. Because um, the earlier you got, you owned the game objects in that year, um, the more points you got. Because you got a point per second of owning the scale. As well as it also helped us score in a known level state on that scale rather than a tipped up one. And it gave us more time to score our second uh, game objects. So this actually worked pretty darn well for us. Um, none of these sprint distances are in a revolutionary energy speed, and I'll mention this again in the next slide, but it can produce relatively small fractional seconds or a second improvement. And that can matter, especially in a game like 2018, um, where if I pull up the right thing here, you'll see the fractional of a second matters. The Blue Alliance gets here first, Red Alliance gets here right after him. But the Blue Alliance, these fractional seconds start adding up, and the Red Alliance runs into the scale because it's up to the later cubes. So having that fraction of a second allows the Blue Alliance to score more cubes and screws up the Red Alliance's scoring. Um, so 
small minute differences, especially in certain games, can really add up. So how do we actually take this optimized length and optimize for the gear ratio and the motors we want to pick in order to achieve the optimal sprint? Um, the actual math for this is a whole bunch of DiffEQ. Um, I'm not really qualified to teach DiffEQ anyway, but there, conveniently for us, there is some great online calculators we can use um, that will factor in your motors, your robot weight, your wheel size, your gear ratios to help you pick um, what you want to do to get the fastest sprints possible. In addition, um, in order to implement those, yes, you could build a custom drivetrain at whatever gear rate you choose, but West Coast Products, Vex, Andymark all have these configurable gearboxes that you can pick with different gear ratios, both in one and two speed varieties, um, to pick this optimal ratio you, you established. Um, in addition, if you're not direct driving a wheel, if you are just... Uh, if you're if your output shaft for your gearbox and your wheel have a chain between them you can always play with the sprocket sizes on both of those or a belt and the pulley sizes um in order to manipulate your overall gear ratio um so that's great for teams that may be locked into a certain gearbox and do that um, i also will mention that even the 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 kit bot these days has like four different gear ratio options you can buy for it i'm sure only one comes shipped to you in the kit but if you have a few extra dollars you can spare you can get you can buy another gear set from Andy Mark that'll change your gear ratios in there. Even if you want to stick with the kit bot, you can optimize a little bit more. Um, so I'd highly encourage looking at this kind of stuff. Like I mentioned in the last slide, it's not going to revolutionize your end-to-end -end speed. You're not going to get what used to take you 10 seconds to drive is not going to take you three seconds now, unless you're really, really out there and with bad ratios. Um, but sometimes turning from three seconds to two and a half seconds can make a difference, uh, especially when you're doing something over and over again or when it's a very time-sensitive competitive portion where if you score something first, it gives you an advantage. Um, so the, the calculator I use the most is the iLight Drive Simulator written by Jesse K. Um, I will make sure I post a link down in the comments beneath um, or in the video description beneath. Um, but I have a couple slides on it I can talk about, but in reality, since I'm doing this here, I'm just gonna pull it up. Um, so this, this is the new 2020 pre-release candidate. Um, so I'm not super familiar with a lot of the changes he's made. Um, but it, the fundamentals are still all here where you have over on this left panel you can set all sorts of stuff about your robot you can pick out different motors from your drop down menu he's got preloaded motor data for him you got the, the Neo motor if I wanted to pick that I can pick it if I can actually click on it and you'll see all these graphs update as you make these different changes so I'm going to go back to the mini sim if I wanted to change the amount of motors total in my drivetrain I can set that here um, if I wanted to change what gears I have driving stuff, I can set that here. And it'll change things. Uh, let me go to 13 because it'll highlight something in a sec. Um, if I wanted to say a two speed ratio, I could change that here, change my wheel size, um, so on and so forth. Um, coefficients of friction, battery or robot weight, um, the auxiliary rates, the weight of your batteries and bumpers, etc. Um, or if you wanted to have carry another robot as he describes there or pick up a goal um, Say I'm picking up a whole bunch of heavy game pieces. I add more auxiliary weight there You can also manipulate your sprint distance. I already have the 18 foot here um, But if I wanted to change this you will see Some of these graphs over here on the right side will change based on my motion profile and the sprints I'm trying to do I'll go back to that 18 foot though um, Also change your electrical characteristics. I don't play with these too much with the exception of your current limit per motor uh, if you want to leave it unlimited, leave it at 150. Uh, but if you wanted to, if you are using a current limit on your Talon SRX or your uh, Spark on your uh, Neo or um, Spark Max, that's the word I'm looking for there. Um, you can set that here. And I'll show you kind of how that manipulates stuff in a second. Um, as I kind of go into these graphs, you can use to analyze your drivetrain. Um, if you look at this graph, your accelerations in this kind of teal line, your foot speed, your feet per second on the floor is in this black line and your uh, distance traveled is this purple line as well as you can see when these red lines are present your wheels are slipping on the floor and when these orange lines are present you're hitting your current limits um, as well as you look down this electrical characteristics um, this red line represents a Rio brownout um, at 6.9 volts I believe or 7 volts or whatever it is um, and whenever your system voltage which is this dotted line or your applied voltage just start dropping beneath that you're hitting Rio brownout states You'll see these two graphs kind of match up. You see my acceleration is peaking and valleying here. That's as I'm browning out and removing my brownouts, I have acceleration and I don't. 
Um, so if I come down here and hit a current limit on here of say 50 amps, you'll notice that I no longer actually crash, cross this Rio brownout threshold and my acceleration appears much more smooth because I'm applying voltage to it the whole time. I'm not going into these brownout states where it's um, browning out constantly. Acceleration might be a little bit less because I don't have quite as much current going to it. Um, and there, he does have a trade-off slide over here about where your current limit should be set. Um, I don't, I haven't played with, so these on the right panel are a little bit different than they were last year. Um, so I haven't played with them as much. Um, but that enables you to start making the trade-offs. As well as he also has built in deceleration modeling now since 2019, um, where he gives you three options to choose from. Coast mode would be basically you just remove voltage from the motors and you allow friction to decelerate you. Um, not generally the recommended way. Um, there's also brake, which is if you apply your speed controllers into brake, which shunts the leads together, um, create a passive braking system, electrical braking system. This is not a mechanical brake on the system. Um, but this also isn't actively applying the voltage to it. In reverse would be you actively apply a, a voltage in the opposite direction, basically. Um, this is kind of what a PID controller would do. We found in, in looking at our models from our PID controllers, um, it's somewhere between the brake and the reverse mode is what we were getting, kind of alternating as we throttled towards the position we wanted. Um, so we will, I generally sim, simulating in reverse now, I find it to be the closest. Um, there definitely is some work that can be done about how you actually, how well you can apply these deceleration models, but it does give you the next edge to trying to design a little bit more. Um, and you'll also see like in this mode, you see your per motor current, well it's high at the beginning when you accelerate, and then as soon as I hit my deceleration, it's it's peaking again. If I were to switch out of reverse to coast, you'll see I don't have that same kind of peak there. Um, as well as you'll see, I'm hitting my current limits again as I'm decelerating. My wheels are slipping a little bit as I try to yank them in the opposite direction. Um, over here on the side, we have these trade-offs for where you set your voltage limits, or your current limits, sorry. Um, so if I wanted to set these to 30 amps, you can see this is all the way up here, and it's affecting a lot more of my total travel time to stop and whatnot. And I see my heading and current limits all over the place. If I leave them a more reasonable 50 amps or... 40 amps, well, like an actual type. Um, you'll see it affects things differently. He's also got this new motion profiling tab. It's not something I've played with too much, it's new. Um, but you can turn off different things here. You can hide or show how my deceleration distance, um, how long I'm cruising. So if I were to show both of these, um, it, it'll show where I'm cruising, where I'm decelerating based on my different gear ratios here. Um, how many feet I'd be cruising versus how many feet I'd be decelerating. Um, but it also it shows, we have got a lot of interesting stuff in here that I'm gonna start playing with more. Um, my target distance, this purple line, is gonna be changed based on my sprint distance here. So we're gonna change that to 25 feet. That moves up there and all the other lines adjust as appropriate. I go ahead and set it back to 18 feet. Um, down here, this is an updated version of the graph I use a lot. Um, this is for figuring out what gear ratio I want to be sprint distance wise. So both this and this, the x-axis, are the gear ratio. Um, where this dotted line, um, this dotted red line that goes vertically, um, is based on what ratio I'm, I'm tuned at, based on the different numbers I put in here. If I were to take this to 10, you'll see that that line moves. Well, none of these up here actually moved, just the, the target there. Take this back to 13, I think as I was. Um, so basically, on this graph, you have your total line time to goal and its full speed as this dotted line, and total time calculating the stop as well as the solid line. Um, and then over here on the y-axis is your time in seconds. So you can start picking your ratio and tuning that to try to minimize either your free speed or your with your stop, depending on how much you calculate or trust the deceleration model in there, um, to optimize for where you want to tune your your match cat or where you want to tune your gear ratio. Um, so you, you want to minimize the time, obviously. So in this case, with the without the stop full speed, basically all these times are right around two seconds, kind of between six to one and 10 to one. So you could pick anywhere between here and you're only seeing you know a fraction of a second difference. Um, if you're factoring in the total travel time with the stop, you might, it moves it over a little bit between kind of this 10 to 12 to one. Um, so maybe you want to shoot for this 10 to one line if I were to say, move this over to like a 10 tooth, yeah, somewhere like there, or maybe I'll leave an 11 tooth on this one. You kind of see you're in this happy dwell spot on both these lines. 
Um, generally, once I find my dwell, I try to go gear as conservatively as possible to reduce the amount of um, current draw I'm going to have in all sorts of situations and ease the amount of time I'm going to hit my current limits. Um, so that's generally how you kind of use this. There's a lot of stuff you can play with in here, a lot more features and adjustments you can make. Um, but it's a great tool for trying to figure out what gear ratios and what motor combinations you want to use to get your ideal sprint distance. Come back over to our PowerPoint. Next thing we're going to talk about is traction limiting. What is traction limiting and why does it matter? Um, so what happens when your drive motors are outputting near their max torque? Are your wheels slipping on the carpet? Are you making like little mini burnouts? Um, or do they? You're, are you stalling your motors? Your, your motors are drawing and you're not actually moving anywhere. If your wheels are slipping, that means you're traction limited. Um, and being traction limited is generally viewed as being as, as a good thing. Um, traction limiting helps mitigate a lot of the bad things that happen to your motors when they stall. Um, it means you aren't gonna you should draw less current. It doesn't mean you're not drawing any current. Um, doesn't mean you're drawing low current. You can still be drawing plenty of current, but you can you'll be drawing less uh, since you're not stalling. Hopefully, you're also not building as much heat in your motors, um, which can lead to motor damage, especially with things like Fal or uh, not Falcons, but uh, sensitive by pros. Um, generally speaking, though, torque beyond what it requires to create wheel slip isn't actually going to give you any more pushing power. It's kind of going to waste. Your pushing power is limited more by your traction than your motor torque. Um, the heavier and the higher torque or the higher coefficient friction of wheels you have, the more pushing power air quote you're going to get. Um, but gearing down beyond the point to be traction limited can still be useful because you can be traction limited at a lower current draw, especially if you are were if you are putting like a current limit on there if you're not traction limited before you hit that current limit you're not really traction limited so how do we factor how do we figure out what our traction limits are well you have to figure out how much traction we have um the shorthand is the classical model of our my force of static friction is equal to my coefficient of friction multiplied by my normal force and generally speaking my normal force is my weight the weight of my robot plus the battery and the bumpers don't forget that or any game pieces i'm picking up um Empirically, we found that there are additional factors beyond this, but this is effective enough for calculation-wise. Um, there, like 234 has done some data looking at the contact patch. Well, it never, this equation never factors in how much you're touching the ground. It just says your coefficient of fraction, static friction, doesn't distinguish between a one-inch wheel and a two-inch wheel versus tank tread. Um, but empirical data supports that the contact patch may impact things. Um, there's a certain amount of interlocking effect between carpet and certain types of wheel tread that happens. Um, and even with rubber and HDPE surfaces, you may get some kind of stiction up there, so to speak. Um, and the biggest thing here is your robot weight and your coefficient of static friction, they matter a lot. Um, and in certain cases with heavier game pieces, game piece weight can influence this. Especially in a game like Recycle Rush or Zone Zeal in 2002, where you're either picking up a whole bunch of uh, totes and whatnot. Um, like if you're lifting these off the ground, that that changes. Like if you're lifting 30 pounds of game pieces, your what used to be a 120 pound robot is now a 150 pound robot. It changes this. Um, with the lighter games, the foam balls, or whatever. Now it's not a huge deal. But if it's we're picking up big stuff, especially multiple big things, or like Zone Zero in 2002, teams were picking up these 100 pound mobile goals. It can fundamentally change how much your robot weighs. So don't forget that for certain games. Also consider your center of mass location. Um, with a standard tank drive, your wheels are linked together on each side, so they're all going to slip or not slip together. Um, if you don't do that, your wheels can slip at different points. So this comes in a lot of play with like mechanic drives, where each wheel is driven independently. Swerve drives, where each wheel is driven independently. They're going to slip at different points. Um, so your wheels that have more weight on them are going to slip at a different amount of force than the wheels that have less weight, which will slip earlier which can change the amount of force they put out onto the floor and screw, especially these mechanic drives, like if, if a couple of your weight wheels are slipping a lot earlier than a couple of your other wheels, it may screw up your whole controls algorithm for moving around. Um, so think about that, try to evenly distribute your weight. Um, and also game pieces come to play here. What used to be an evenly distributed robot now picks up 30 pounds of totes in 2015. Suddenly the, the front wheels are tracks limited to a different point than the back wheels are. So consider that. Um, now we're going to talk about two speed and one speed shifters and if you need to shift from my experience I would not recommend shifting simply for the sake of shifting um, there may be purchasing concerns where you need to purchase your gearboxes ahead of time you won't have the option sure you purchase it and you end up using it but 
shifting gearboxes, they add a lot of weight, size, cost, complexity, and additional places to brake. Um, they typically require a pneumatic system. There are some teams that have used motors or servo shifts, but those are relatively rare and less efficient or less effective. Um, so if you're using pneumatics elsewhere, sure, it's great. If you're not using pneumatics elsewhere, you're adding a whole pneumatic system just for this two-speed shifter. That doesn't mean there aren't scenarios in which you want to shift. Um, if your sprint speed, you determined, isn't traction limited, maybe you need a low gear to make it traction limited if it doesn't involve changing your stuff around too much to hit that traction limited point. Um, if you have, for whatever reason, a realistic need for more torque than your sprint speed provides, um, then you can look at needing a low gear. Um, but keep in mind, if you're in a pushing match, generally speaking, the defender's already done their job. Um, they, they don't necessarily need to hold you to zero game pieces of score. They need to slow you down a lot. So if you have to push through them repeatedly, they're, they're kind of doing what they need to do. Um, there may be reasons where you want to mechanically, you have a mechanical solution to lower your current draw. Um, so say you are traction limited, but you're only traction limited at 70 amps. You're going to get to, you're going to, foot, you're going to be tripping your breakers. You're going to be going past your current limits. Um, so you may need to produce more torque mechanically, um, in which case you may need a low gear for that. Um, also on the real bleeding edge of things, if you have time to get into this, um, maybe with unbagged teams we'll have more time, there's potential for auto shifting code in which you shift from low gear to high gear to optimize your accelerations even further. You have to keep in mind that with basically every shifter, um, there's going to be a, a dead period between low gear and high gear, so you really have to get some empirical testing um, to see if this really actually is advantageous to you. Um, and on the, on the true bleeding edge of things, there are teams that have CVTs, continuously variable transmissions that really auto shift through the full range to be operating at the max, the max power or the max efficiency the whole time, which is really, really cool. Um, I don't know how much testing they've done to actually prove that they're, that's theoretically what they do. I don't know how well they're actually matching that goal, um, but if they are, that's awesome. Or even if they're getting close to it, it's awesome. Um, and from my personal experience, every time I've had a two-speed shifter, almost all of you have stayed in one gear for 90% or more of the season. Um, so really, you factor in your drivers, how much time are they going to get to shifting? Um, are they going to experience in both gears? Do they want experience in both gears? Um, even, even some really, really high-level teams, like 254-level teams, will sometimes end up in one gear or the other the entire time, and two-speed shifter doesn't end up helping them a whole lot. Um, another scenario in which you might want a two-speed shifter that didn't actually print out on the slide is if you have two different sprint distances that are wildly different, say you have Say you need it to optimize for autonomous, but you have a very different distance you want to optimize for teleop. Maybe you have an auto gear and a teleop gear. Um, so that could be a possibility. Um, so some, kind of getting some general tips here as I start wrapping up. Um, there's an FRC adage that I heard from Ty Tremblay on some of the web stuff he's done. Um, a drivetrain won't win you a competition, but it can certainly lose you one. Um, build a drivetrain that's reliable. Don't build something that's too fancy for what you need. Um, don't put 30 feet per second or 25 feet per second to trip your breakers the whole match or build an omni drive that you can't control or don't do something that's going to impact your performance too much um, a bad drivetrain will hurt you a whole lot more than a good drivetrain will help you um, also don't gear faster than your drivers can handle think about how much practice space you have if you're trying to do these 54 foot long sprints over and over again but you only have a 15 foot area to practice in you're never going to get your drivers the ability to get up to full speed in your practice space. So think about when you're setting your strategy and you're optimizing your drivetrain, how much experience your drivers are gonna have with this beforehand. Um, I mentioned this a couple times, but gearing down doesn't just provide a higher stall torque, it also means you're pulling less current across the full range of torque values. Um, so it's useful for limiting your current draws. Um, when you're designing your drivetrain, try to take a holistic view of your robot and your drivetrain as possible. Um, Think about everything. Don't get locked in on just what wheels I'm picking or what motors I'm picking. Um, consider changing the diameter of your wheels to get better than different ratios. Um, how many motors can I allocate to my drivetrain versus how many I need for my shooter or my arm or whatever else. Um, think about where I'm laying stuff out in my frame, all sorts of stuff to manipulate all these values at once. Try to try to take a big picture view. Don't get tunnel visioned on a small thing. Um, and ultimately, weight and center of mass impact your drivetrain as much or more than everything I talked about in here. Um, a higher weight robot will have more traction. Um, it'll also have higher current draws because your force equals mass times acceleration. Um, the more mass you have, if you want the same amount of acceleration, you need more force, which means you need more power, means more current. Um, 
Same with less weight. If force equals mass times acceleration, if you have a set amount of force and you want more acceleration, the later, lower mass robot will have better acceleration at lower current. Um, so in 2017, we saw a lot of teams kind of in the postseason say, hey, we want to be a gear runner that does, uh, going all the way back here, does this sprint over and over and over again, this full field sprint. Um, so we're going to design a really lightweight robot to get that acceleration and do that pulse field sprint as quickly as possible, consistently. That isn't to say there aren't times where you don't want more weight and more traction. Um, if, if having traction to withstand defense or play defense is important to you, that might be valuable. Um, or like, we haven't had one in a while, but towing games exist. If you need traction to move a mobile goal or move these big heavy game objects around, um, having the weight there matters. Um, generally speaking, well, Almost unanimously, I don't know of any situation where it's not. A lower center of mass is better than a higher center of mass. As low as you can get the center of mass, it's better. Um, it's going to be a, a more stable robot that has less rocking. It's wasting less of its inertia. Um, and you can actually apply all these values. Like, if you have a real tall robot, you're not going to accelerate from a dead stop to full speed at full speed. Uh, at full acceleration, you're going to fall over or flirt with falling over. Anyone who built a tall robot in 2018 or 2019 can testify to that. Um, I have a nice GIF of us. This is deceleration rather than acceleration, but um, you see the same idea. It's, we save ourselves here, but we went from full speed to try to stop right away, and we fell over because we're, we're, we had a high center of mass at that point. Our elevator was all the way up. Um, see that in mind, if you actually want to apply all these things we're talking about, keep your center of mass low. Uh, I got some additional resources. I'll make sure I'll post them down in the video description. Um, a lot of this stuff covers a lot of the basics that I kind of assumed you knew and I told you I wouldn't be talking about in here, um, but it's some really great stuff. Um, other videos on how DC motors work and drive system basics. Um, as well as 234 does a lot of really, really cool research and empirical research onto stuff like different motors, accelerations, and traction and stuff like that. So it's great. Um, obviously, if there's a live format, I'd have questions and discussion session here. Thanks to the power of the internet, I can't do that live, but if you post them down in the comment section beneath, we'll try to get to them. So as you can find us on at FRC1712 or at Dogma1712 on basically any social media platform um thanks for your time hopefully you learned something um and thanks for watching